chapter 10, we're looking at verses 16 and 17 in particular, but we will begin tonight verse 14 and just begin there and then we'll settle down in verse 16 and 17. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him um, of whom they have not heard? Believing in him and hearing about him go together. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. Peace with God, peace with one another. That's what the gospel brings. We're reconciled to God, we have peace with Him, don't we? We're no longer at odds with Him. We're in harmony with Him. We're reconciled to Him. And likewise, when people come to Christ, if you may have had opposition with each other at one time, now the opposition's gone. We see that in the Gentiles and the Jews, the great opposition that once existed between them, now that's gone. We have peace. We have peace. We have peace. The gospel of peace, who br the person who brings glad tidings and good things. I may come back to that phrase later on in our study in Romans 10. I don't think I'll touch it tonight. But you can always tell if you're listening to the gospel. Because the gospel will have glad tidings of good things. And we need to look at that. We need to t stop and take a look at that. I think maybe I mentioned it in passing. But we want to look at that even more. Glad tidings of good things. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now you might ask yourself the question, why do we have this verse here in verse 16? When it seems like the Apostle Paul is giving us God's way of salvation. Well, the reason why it's here is because chapter 10 is an explanation or an elaboration of what he's taught in chapter 9, explaining to the Jews why they have not come to faith. The Jews have thought, because they are God's chosen people, the children of Abraham, that by virtue of that, surely they would come to faith, surely they'd believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but in the Jewish community, they're turning to one another and they're saying, why are all the Gentiles coming in and not the Jews? What's the problem here? And of course, in Romans 9, 6, he teaches us that not all Israel is Israel. And he goes through all of that, explaining the sovereignty of God. And he's still explaining that here in chapter 10. And so what we see here in verses 14 and 15, how where it says, how beautiful are the feet of him that preaches the gospel of peace, glad tidings of good things. He talks about believe, believing in him. How can they believe in him lest they hear him? Those two verses are talking about the spreading of the gospel by the preacher, the spreading of the gospel by the church, spreading the gospel by the evangel. Okay? It's where anybody anywhere... If they have two ears here on the side of their head, they can hear that gospel. So he's talking about the gospel call in a general sense. It's just going out everywhere. And when it comes to verses 16 and 17, he's given an explanation to those Jews that though the gospel goes everywhere, they're asking the question, well, how come, how come the Jews aren't believing? He said, though the gospel goes everywhere, it's not always comes to everybody as the gospel of peace. Not everybody recognizes they need peace with God. Not everybody recognizes the peace that they have with God will also give them peace with one another. Jews didn't recognize that if they would receive the gospel, they'd be at peace with the Gentiles, and Gentiles would be at peace with them. They would no longer call the Gentiles the uncircumcised, and the Gentiles never called them the circumcised, and they wouldn't call the Gentiles dogs and barbarians and all this and that, they went, none of that would happen anymore. They heard the gospel, but they never understood the gospel. 
They heard the gospel, they never understood it, and because they never understood it, they never gave heed to it. Now, if you remember last week, we talked a lot about that. They never gave heed because they never understood. And he tells us here in verse 16 and 17 that there is a difference between the general teaching and preaching of the gospel that we see in verses 14 and 15. There's another side of the gospel. And he brings that out in the phrase, they have not all obeyed the gospel. In other words, the gospel went out, but they have not all obeyed. Now that word obeyed there is a very interesting word that you need to think about. That word obeyed there means to obey under. It's a compound word in the Greek. And it means to obey under the authority or obey under the power. If you're out and about in your car and the lights go on in the police car and they pull you over, immediately you're going to listen to them because they're under authority. They are under a power. And when they speak to you, they bring you under that authority. They bring you under that power. And because they bring you under that authority and that power, you are compelled to heed. And that's the idea in this word obeyed. The word obeyed, as we'll see as we move along here, is a special kind of hearing. It's a hearing that's different than what you hear in verse 14 and 15 under the general call. Now we're seeing what we've talked about many times, the effectual call, where there is a work and an operation of the Holy Spirit. Now, and before we move into that, I want you to see something else here in verse 16. They have not all obeyed or obeyed under the authority and the power of the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now he's speaking to the Jews here, Specifically, the Jews respect Isaiah. And he's pointing out to the Jews that are reading his letter that as it was in the days of Isaiah, when God's people were not listening to the prophets, so shall it be in the days of the Messiah and the days following, that the Jews will continue not to hear the gospel. And of course, we looked at this in uh, Matthew chapter 13 last week. And let's just turn over there and look at that again, just, just briefly. We will, hopefully won't take a lot of time there, but let's just look at this. Now, you all know about the sower sows the word, right? You all heard that teaching before. And uh, maybe it's a good idea just to peek at that a little bit before we go into what he has to say here in Matthew 13, 10 through 16. When you first look at Matthew chapter 13, and you see how the Lord Jesus begins in verse 3, he says, He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Now behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Verse 5, some fell in stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others... But others, but others, fell on good ground and yielded crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, the first thing you might want to ask yourself when the Lord said that, how come this one ground's got good ground? What made it good? The ground here is talking about the hearts of humanity. And if you know anything about what the Bible teaches, that the human heart is obstinate against God. The Bible tells us that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. 
That means it's at hostility with God. It's not subject to the law of God, and neither can be. It says in 2 or, uh, yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. And neither can he understand them because they're spiritually discerned. And the whole key here is, if a person is going to have faith that obeys, or they're going to hear and obey, they're going to have to understand something. Well, all natural humanity, man everywhere, in their hearts, are wrong. They're spiritually dead. they got a wrong nature, a sin nature that rules them and governs them. But then we got this one heart. Luke calls it the good and noble heart. That hears the word of God and brings fruit. Now notice the first three grounds don't bring forth any fruit. They show some reaction to the word of God. The wayside ground really doesn't show any kind of reaction. The wayside ground is kind of like a careless attitude in the heart. The, the, or the, yeah, the wayside ground. The stony ground is like a curious heart. They hear it with joy. They're curious. But when trials and tribulations come, persecution comes, all of a sudden they're filled with the question, why God, why God, why God? And nothing ever comes of it. The thorns are, is, is a representative of the human heart. This is full of the cares of life, full of deceitfulness of riches, full of lust for other things, and they may be curious like the wayside or like the stony ground for a while, but here comes all these other things, and, and then whatever they thought they believed, they no longer hook up with it. They easily let go of it. They don't bear any fruit. The only ground that bears fruit is the good ground. Now, I've been taught in days gone by that all of these people become Christians. Some just don't become very fruitful. Well, the fact of the matter is we'll find out that none of these grounds became fruitful except the good ground. It's the only ground that became fruitful. So just because someone hears the word of God and seemingly does something with the word of God doesn't necessarily mean that they heard it and gave heed to it and obeyed it. To give heed to it and obeyed it, when you flush all this out, it means that they persevered with it. They endured it. That's why these other, other uh, Gospels you read, it says, and endured for a season. There was no grace behind whatever faith they were professing. When grace is behind the true faith that a true Christian professes, that true grace behind that true faith causes that true faith to endure and to persevere under all kinds of tests and trials. So, we move from there and we come to verse 10, the purpose of the parables. And it says, why, and the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Why do you do that? And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know or given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Now, the word was given to these ears, wasn't it? They heard it. They were in Romans 14 and 15 with these ears. They weren't in Romans chapter 16 and 17, where verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, this obeying the report of God, this obeying that they never had, this obeying the word of God comes by hearing and hearing out of the word of Christ. And we will see tonight the hearing and hearing out of the word of Christ is a hearing that comes by a special kind of hearing. It comes by the power of God's Holy Spirit. He says to his disciples, to you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So the Lord right there is telling you. He's explaining. He's beginning to explain the parable of the sower right here. He's telling you that those other three kinds of ground, it was never given to them to understand. That's why the birds took it away. Satan came and took it away. That's why the persecution and tribulation came. They're crying, why God? No fruit. That's why the other ones, they received it, acted like they really had something. And then all of a sudden, nothing's there at all. There's no fruit. 
In other words, the receiving of the Word of God, the hearing of the Word of God, heeding it and obeying it will be verified by fruit. If someone says, well, what is the fruit? Well, the fruit is the fruits of righteousness. The fruit is the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus. Those fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, we taught on it here Sunday mornings in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15, where we work out our salvation in fear and trembling because God's at work within us. And that working out our salvation in fear and trembling, trembling, Paul says, obey in my absence just like you obeyed in my presence. And that obeying was to lead to something in their life, that they were to become blameless in their behavior, outward behavior. They were to become harmless in their inward dispositions and their attitudes towards God and towards man. And they would become children without rebuke, that they would shine as the lights in the heavens against the blackness of night. In other words, these three types of ground never produced that kind of fruit and never became obvious they were a follower of Christ. Now, they professed Christ. Like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, he said, many will come into me and say, Lord, Lord, but will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they don't do the will of the Father. Those that enter in are those who do the will of the Father. These are talking about all the great things that they're doing, but they're practicing lawlessness. Now, practicing lawlessness sometimes is not clearly understood by us because we think of lawlessness like somebody robbing a bank or like the people over there in the Far East that are slaughtering people, ISIS, and things of that sort. But lawlessness, if you look at the parable of the sower, and you look at lawlessness, what really lawlessness is, it's putting God off. It's sitting God aside. When the Bible talks about someone being in the flesh, it's talking about them being under the governing powers of the flesh. And when someone's in the flesh and under the governing powers of the flesh, it says they mind the things of the flesh. And when you're minding the things of the flesh, because you're under the governing of the flesh, what are you doing? You're seeking self. Your self is your center, not Christ. Self is your purpose, not Christ. Self is your ambition, not Christ. And that's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him who loved us and gave himself for us. That's why Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, none of these things move me, for I do not count my life dear unto me, that I might fulfill, finish the race and fulfill the ministry the Lord has given me. It's like we learned on Sunday when we taught that Timothy had a proven character, and his proven character was is he cared for the interests of Christ. He cared for the church. These individuals in the sower sows the word, those three grounds there that don't produce fruit, all they produce was a profession. They profess, Lord, Lord. That's all they got. They never got beyond that. That's all they had. And the Lord right here tells us why that happened. It happened because it wasn't given to them. That's why the Lord said over there in John chapter 6, verse 44. He says, no one can come unto me unless the Father draws him. That drawing of the Father to come to Christ is that effectual call. It is, it is that hearing the word of God by the Spirit of God. Can you see that, everybody? Does that real clear to you? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 says to abstain from every appearance of evil, abstain from the lust of the flesh, that the Gentiles might glorify God in the day of visitation as they see your good works. What are the good works that they're seeing? They're seeing this righteous, holy, godly life, this shining like the stars of light at night, 
That's what they're seeing. So in other words, when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, not only does it affect justification where God imputes righteousness to you, it also is the very beginning of sanctification. Justification and sanctification begin simultaneously. They're different. They need to be understood correctly. Justification is God imputing righteousness to you, and the righteousness he imputes to you is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. On that cross, your sins were not being held against you. They were imputed to Christ. He became a sin offering for you. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. He became a propitiatory sacrifice. He was fulfilling the, the, the demands of the law that were calling for our condemnation. Okay? He fulfilled all of that. His righteous life went to the cross. He fulfilled all the demands of righteousness by his life. He fulfilled all the demands of righteousness in his death. That righteousness was given to you as a free gift. No strings attached. Didn't cost you anything. Cost God everything. But at the same time justification takes place, the Bible says that God made you to be dead to sin and alive unto God. And how can somebody who's dead to sin and alive unto God continue in sin? The Bible says that this righteousness that God has given to us is a gift of righteousness. And the Bible talks about how grace reigns through righteousness. Sin reigns through death. But grace reigns through righteousness. It reigns through imputed righteousness. Grace is reigning, Sam. God has imputed the perfections of Christ to you. They're yours. It's your gift. But at the same time, exactly the same time, God Sanctification, it begins. And sanctification is grace reigning, and the evidence of its reigning is a godly life. Do you see that? All of that takes place in the person that Jesus said, it wasn't given unto them, but it's given to you to know the mysteries. It was given to you to know the saving event of the cross. It was given to you when you heard the gospel that you heard it deeper than your ears. You heard it in your heart. You were like Lydia. Lydia, maybe at first was only hearing here, but all of a sudden she was hearing here. Why? Because the Lord opened her heart. She may have came with wayside ground. She may have came with stony ground. She may have came with thorny ground. But God came and gave her good ground. That's why you have to remember, you've got family and loved ones and friends that you cry tears over all the time because they got wayside, stony, and thorny ground. But God can give them good ground. God gave you good ground. What's going to keep him from giving them good ground? Always remember that. Never lose heart. Never lose hope. As long as God is who he is. Can you say amen? So the true hearing of faith is marked by obedience. That's what I want you to see tonight. It's marked by obedience. Verse 16 says, They have not all obeyed the gospel. Notice, notice verse 18 of Romans chapter 10. It says, Their sound has gone out to all the earth in their words to the ends of the world. Now notice it says, Their sound, that's the sound of the preacher preaching, has gone out to the ends of the earth. Their words, what words are those? The words of the preacher. That's the general gospel. To the ends of the ends of the world. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Verse 21 says, But to Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, what's happening here is that through the preaching of the prophets in the Old Testament, it was constantly declared to them, constantly. And their response to the word of God, their response was so negative, was so contrary, that there was a judicial judgment that was given to them. And that judicial judgment was, if you want it that way, you can have it that way. It's like you see over there in Romans chapter 1, I talked about this a little bit last week. 
when he says he turns them over to a reprobate mind. And a lot of people think that that just happens to be, he turns you over to a reprobate mind and you become a homosexual. No, when you read all of Romans chapter 1, when he turns you over to a reprobate mind, he's turning you over to all kinds of different sins. And he lists a whole host of different sins. And that is as though God is revealing himself in creation, as God is revealing himself in providence, as God is revealing himself in history. And, and, as, and as you see this and hear this, you ignore it because you're practicing lawlessness. You'd rather have life your way. And so you're kind of pulling away from whatever revelation God has. You're pulling it, saying, I want to go my way. And God kind of lets go of the rope and you go back. When you go back, you go further into more different kinds of sins. Now, somebody says, well, is there any hope for me? I went back into different kinds of sins. Well, all you have to do is look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. It says, you were once a homosexual, you were once an adulterer, you were once a fornicator, you were once a drunkard, you were once a, uh, an extortionist, you were once this and that, but you are now washed. You are now justified. You are now sanctified in the name of our Lord and by the Spirit of our God. So you've got to remember, just because God gives someone judicial judgment, and that he gives them what he wants, and it's a form of judgment, doesn't mean that God has discarded them. And you'll find out when you go to Romans chapter 11 that God has not discarded the Jews. He hasn't discarded them. They're going to be brought in. And if you know somebody who's gone into sin, and you're thinking, oh man, maybe, the, maybe they're like these people here. Don't think that way. God forbid that I could ever talk about my life before I became a Christian and what I was involved with. God forbid. But did God save me? Did God save Paul? Did God save that Philippian jailer? Did God save all kinds of people that were, had a, a, all hosts of kinds of sins? Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, the tax collectors and the harlots will come into the kingdom of God before you. All of them had tasted a certain element of God's judgment of pulling back from God. But though they pulled back from God, God pulled forward for them. Gave them a new heart, brought them into salvation. Can you say amen? That's good news, everybody. The word obeyed there again is a compound word, and it means hearing under. Hearing under the authority. Hearing under the power that causes someone to yield to what you hear. Just think about your own salvation experience when you heard the word of God. How you found yourself yielding to the truth of the gospel. Why did you find yourself yielding? Because you heard now in a brand new way. One night you may have not been believing. The next day all of a sudden you find yourself believing. A new heart came. There's something about this hearing that humbles us, everybody. It humbles a person that they might yield obedience. It's the difference of hearing words spoken by the preacher and hearing by the Spirit. There's always this element of obedience to faith. Always. For example, in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, it says, it speaks about the obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name. Obedience, obedience, obedience. There's a difference between hearing and giving obedience and hearing and giving a profession. Hear me really close. Night and day difference. When you read about the goats and the tares, or excuse me, the, the wheat and the tares and the goats and the sheep, you see that in the Bible? The tares and the goats are those that have a profession. The wheat and the sheep are those that have obedience. That's the key. That's the key distinction that's involved. If obedience is there, and that obedience is found in that person's life, giving heed to that which God is desiring from them, doesn't mean they walk in it perfectly by any means, but there is an ever persevering direction in their life where they're giving God what God wants. That's obedience. See, a lot of times it takes time for certain things to be proven out. Right? 
When you plant a seed in the ground, it takes a while, but you find out if anything's going to happen to that seed. It's the same with God's word. Time proves out everything. And the, the number one thing we look at right here tonight is this idea of obedience. There's always that element of obedience to faith. We read Romans 1, 5. Look at Romans 16, 19. He says, I'll just quote part of it. He says, for your obedience has become known to all. What became known to all? Your profession? No, your obedience. In verse 26, it says, for obedience to the faith. There was obedience to the faith. What's that mean, obedience to the faith? That means the faith there is talking about Christian doctrine. And what was given to the Christian doctrine? Obedience. Remember I told you that sanctification, God's way of sanctifying us, is bringing certainty of Christian doctrine into our life. And out of that certainty of Christian doctrine, appeals are made to us. Let's go this way. Grace wants to reign through righteousness by going this way. Let's go this way. And, sure, we may stumble and fumble and bumble around. I don't know a Christian that does it from time to time with those, with those appeals. But you'll find yourself obeying. You've got to remember, you're growing. When you're a little baby, you don't obey as, as much as you did when you're an 8-year-old, when you're a 16-year-old, when you're a 25-year-old, a 35-year-old. When you grow, obedience ought to be flourishing in your life. Now, Christians ought to think about that a little bit. You, if someone professes to be a Christian, and you've been professing to be a Christian for uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, there ought to be, obedience ought to be like second nature to you. It ought to be something that's just there. I'm troubled by people that tell me they're, they're, they're a Christian and been a Christian for, I mean, many years. I mean, they've been taking notes and everything else. But they're they're still going a wayward direction that's overly obvious unchristian. Not talking about somebody who bumps, bumps their nose a little bit here and there as a Christian. Not talking about that. I'm talking about things that are overly obvious. Cursing God. That's overly obvious, right? Sleeping around. Overly obvious, right? Getting drunk all the time. Overly obvious, right? Causing division in churches. Overly obvious. You know, you want to give everybody cut as much slack as you can cut, but then you don't want to move to, into an area, a realm that you don't use discernment anymore. Obedience is the great test of anyone that has heard the gospel in a spiritual sense. For anyone can agree to the truth just mentally and not obey it. In other words, don't act on it. Don't give any evidence to it. The way to test the difference between a mental agreement and, and faith is this element of obedience. Now, I want you to see something about obedience that you may not have ever thought about before. I want you to know that obedience begins in the heart, not in the hands and the feet. Faith always leads to action. Because faith is obeying. So it's always going to lead to action. Again, Acts 16, verse 14, Lydia's heart was opened, and watch what it says. She gave heed to the things spoken by Paul. Now, what did she give heed to? What did she do? She gave heed to. She wasn't passively listening. She gave heed. What was she doing? She was embracing. She was engaged. And what was being said, this action of hers was an inward action within her heart. For that is where obedience begins. Remember that tonight. Don't ever forget that. You may fumble in your obedience in your actions, but don't fumble in your obedience in your heart. Obedience begins in the heart. Sometimes it takes a little bit to get into our actions, but it begins in the heart. How does it begin in the heart? By giving heed. By the heart saying yes. By the heart being engaged with. By the heart saying, yes, Lord. That's the way I'm going to go. But it has to end up in your actions as well. And we'll see that here in just a moment. Obedience includes repentance. Repentance. 
There's no such thing as faith in God, faith in Christ, without repentance towards God. The Bible talks about repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Talks about that. Paul talks about that in Acts chapter 20, 19 or 20. He says, testifying to both Jews and Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Both of them begin in the heart before they're seen in the fruit of actions. It begins in the heart with conviction. Conviction, you may never see someone can see outwardly what, what's happening in the heart. Conviction is happening in the heart. When, God, when someone hears the word of God and begins to give heed to it. It's an action in their heart. It leads to an inward recognition and admission that we have sinned against God, that we've transgressed his commandments and that we're guilty sinners with an awful sin nature. And in our hearts and in our mind, we have surrendered to the truth about the cross, of what Christ says about us. And we have ceased defending ourselves. We're no longer saying we're a drunkard when we just drank on the weekends. We're now a drunkard. We don't have to be on a seven-day binge to be excluded from that sin. As long as someone continues to defend themselves at, over their sin, they have not repented, which means they have not given heed to the word of Christ. But as soon as a person stops defending himself, he's lost his argument, and he's found an answer. And that answer is the Christ event on the cross. And now there's a surrender. And it all took place inside their heart before they ever made a profession that Jesus is Lord with their mouth. That's why Romans 10, 9, and 10 is talking about as you go through your life, righteousness acts this way. It says, Jesus has died and God has raised him from the dead. And he's my Lord. That begins in the heart, but it does end up in the mouth. And it does end up in our actions. In 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 9, that repentance that begins in the heart does get into, the act, does get into our actions. Because it talks about turning from your idols. Turn from your idols means you turn from your sin. You turn from your idols to serve the living and true God. In other words, to serve the living and true God means a life of obedience. That's all, it all happens in your heart. And not only in your heart does it happen, but it's evidenced in your life. A person who spiritually hears the word of Christ within their heart will want to turn away from their sins and begin to life, live a life that pleases God. This is something the Jews were not doing when they heard the gospel. But the Gentiles were. The person who only mechanically hears, which were the Jews, they continue as they are. They may decide to reform their ways and do a few good works, but they never come to obedience and serving the living and true God. That never happens. The vital aspect of faith is that it comes out of hearing the word of Christ. Look at verse 17, Romans 10. So then faith comes. So then faith comes. So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing, and the, in the Greek it means, and hearing out of, out of the word of Christ. In other words, you hear the word of Christ, but out of the word of Christ, faith comes. It actually comes to you out of hearing it. Not everybody hears the word of Christ the same way. But some will hear the word of Christ, and out of that word of Christ, faith comes. And it begins in the heart. And it begins in the heart in repentance towards God. It begins in the heart. Faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it begins. It was given to them to understand the mystery. Understand the mystery of the cross. The cross event. The, the, the saving event of the cross. This is the most a vital aspect of faith. Right here what we're talking about. It comes out of hearing the word of Christ. By the spirit. Which leads you and I to admit within ourselves, what we're completely 
helpless and hopeless and that we have accepted the message of the cross as the one who is sent from God to reconcile us to God by bearing our sin and our guilt. We know that our salvation is in him and in him alone and none of us have anything to boast about in and of ourselves. We know that it's all in him and of him and so we find ourselves glowing in the Lord. A glowing in the Lord means this. We find ourselves boasting in the Lord. We recognize that once we felt that we were Christians because we were religious and we belonged to a church. But now we heard out of the word of Christ. We heard it like we've never heard it before. We've been convicted of it, convinced about it. And in our hearts there's repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And we recognize that he has rescued us by the cross. We believe it. There's a work of the Spirit going on inside of our heart and inside of our life. And we're boasting in the Lord. That's what Paul meant when he said, I glory in the cross. I don't glory in all these other things. They're like dung to me. I glory in the cross. I boast in the cross. How, that's another test right there about our, if you're a Christian or not. If you're a Christian, you will boast in the Lord about your salvation. You won't boast that I raised my hand and I went up and I said a prayer. That won't be on the tips of your tongue. You will be boasting in the Lord. You'll be boasting in the, in the saving event of the cross. You'll be boasting in it. You know, when somebody's boasting, you know, when you get around people that fish and people that hunt and shoot animals, the big horns and and everything, they start talking loudly about what they're boasting about. Christians, when they boast about the Lord, they like to talk, speak loudly about Him. They're exuberant. They're enthusiastic. Isn't that right? Now, I know we're all wired different and emotionally. I know that. I know that we are. You might say, I'm a little more emotional than some people. Okay? But you know what? There's nothing wrong with all of us being enthusiastic enthusiastic over someone that would come and lay down his life for us and save us and that we have we have known and experienced this in our heart and once this happens we're ready to go on with our lives confessing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and he is our Savior and that he has bought, bought us with his life and that we have no right to ourselves. See, this is all evidence of obedience. We're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We have, no, we have come to the place to see that we have no right to ourselves. What's the scripture say over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 or 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20? It says, you've been bought with a price. You're no longer your own. You don't belong to yourself any longer. Therefore, what do you do with yourself? You glorify God, both in your body and in your spirit, which belongs to God. Now, you may not have all these things explained to you. These rudiments and all this understanding hasn't been explained to you as a new Christian. But you cannot help but agree with all of these things because your heart has been brought into harmony with God. And if your heart has been brought into harmony with God, your heart automatically is in harmony with what he wants. And as soon as you hear about it, boy, you're delighted to hear about it. That's another evidence of, a, of the Christian that obeys is that he's in harmony with God and he loves what God loves and wants what God wants and desires what God wants. In other words, He's not trying to put on some kind of an obedience like the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts all line up, and they've learned all these rules and regulations, and now they've got to apply themselves to those rules and regulations. A Christian don't have to apply themselves to any rules and regulations. According, as far as the heart of the Christian is concerned, there's no rules and regulations. There's God, my Father. There's Jesus, my Savior. What does he want? He can have it. The got to, the have to, the supposed to, the need to, the ought to has really left the heart. It's just nothing but a great, big, gigantic want to, desire to. And I guess there is a need to, an ought to, and, a want, and all that in there, 
because you're demanding of yourself. This is the way you're going to go, Charlie Brown. You're not going to go your direction. You're going to go God's direction. So a Christian oftentimes will find themselves disciplining themselves. And that's not to be confused as legalism. All that we're talking about tonight is a part of this, what is called the obedience to the faith. An external mechanically hearing will never lead to obedience unto the faith. But when one truly hears out of the word of Christ by the Spirit of God, there comes a faith that immediately seeks to obey and to serve the living and true God. True faith also means that we become a part of God's people. 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, 5 and 6. Notice what it says here. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and, and in the Holy Spirit. With much assurance, you might know what manner of men we are. But watch what verse 6 says. To these people who heard the word of God with power. Look what happened to them. They became followers of us and of the Lord. Now followers of us, there's referring to Paul and his group. And of the Lord. Having received the word with much affliction, with joy in the Holy Spirit, which simply means here that they have aligned themselves with the apostles and the church. In other words, they were professing Christ and going on living any way they want to live and avoid the church. No, all of a sudden, the, the church coming together as a church became a big deal. It really amazes me when coming together as a, as a, as a church is not a big deal to people. I mean, I just got to tell you something. Being a Christian as long as I've been a Christian and being a minister as long as I've been a minister, that always will bug me and it will never stop bugging me. I mean, I can't imagine my fingers and, and parts of my body wanting to go off and do their own thing and not be with the body. I just can't understand that. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. Part of the obedience to the faith is coming together as a church. And I'm going to be honest with you, that's not Sundays, that's Sundays, that's Sunday morning school, Sunday school, that's, that's Wednesdays, that's any time the church comes together, you come together. Because your first allegiance is to Christ. And your allegiance to Christ is demonstrated by your love for the brethren. He says, you became followers of us, of us and the Lord. They were aligned to the church. They were connected to the body. No true Christian will want to be isolated. They'll instinctive, instinctively want to be with other Christians. Let me tell you something. There was a time in my life I was single with three children. And work 8, 10, 12 hours a day. I still go to every service I could go to. Do you see and understand why I don't buy all this baloney? People are busy. People are that. People got to do this. People got to do that. Another thing. I wonder what would happen if the Lord Jesus Christ said, I want you to come together and meet with me tonight. What would you say to him personally? Oh, you'd be there. But what you don't understand when the scripture says, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves but come together as a church, that is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to you. He's just not looking at you, and you're looking at him. He's speaking from the scriptures. Look at verses 9 and 10 of 1 Thessalonians 1. He says, You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. In other words, they renounced the world, they forsook their idolatry, they aligned themselves up with the church. How do I know that? Because verse 10 says, They waited for his Son from heaven. They waited for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. This passage right here also shows us that they have aligned to the church by sharing in the hope of the church, which is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot find any picture in the New Testament that depicts Christians not coming together. You just can't find it. You can see, find warnings against it. But that's the way it happened. That's the way Christians carried on. That's a part of the obedience of the faith. And when Christians don't do that, they're not being obedient to that element of the Christian doctrine. They're not being obedient to that. 
Now, again, remember, this obedience we're talking about is a glad, joyful obedience. It's not speaking about an obedience that you have to try to rev up. The Bible tells us that the commandments of God are not grievous. There's nothing that God would say to you or to me that's grievous, that's burdensome, that would hold you back and hold you down. None of that is true. But if you feel that way, then you just may be someone who's governed by the flesh and giving yourself over to what the flesh wants. And that's never good. These individuals became baptized. And you know, back in the day, when they, you become baptized, it was a lot different than today. Because when you, they became baptized, they were openly identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the church. And they easily became marked individuals among their family, among their neighbors, and even the Roman government for martyrdom. Verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, it mentions their work of faith and their labor of love. Their work of faith and labor of love all means in the context of them as a church, a local body of believers. When you read that passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, and it says, don't forsake the assembling yourselves together as you see that day approaching even more so and that you come together and stir one another up, one another up to what? To love and to good works. And what does this passage say? Their labor of love. Their work of faith. Where was that being, where was that being demonstrated among God's people? Sometimes a lot of people talk about they want to have a, a church like the book of Acts. Well, if you want to have a church like the book of Acts, you've got to act like the people of the book of Acts. Amen? Now, let me just, we're coming to the close here. I've only got a few minutes. Let's look at this word, obedience, one more time. Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. The parable of the two sons. Remember that parable? This is not the son that was the prodigal in his, in his, in his legalistic brother. We're not talking about those two sons. This is the parable of the two sons. And in this parable, the first son said, I will not, but later repented. Marty will have it up on the screen. And she'll go through the verses as I comment on them for the sake of time. The first son, father said, I want you to go into the vineyard. And the first son says, I will not. But later he repented and he went. The second son said, he would. He said, sure, I'll do that. But he did not. The first son obeyed. And the second son did not obey. So when you come to verse 31... Our Lord says, which of the two did the will of his father? And they said unto him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But they listened to him. They heard him. They talked about him. They may have even said that he was a prophet. But they didn't do anything about what they said. See, the second son said yes. So evidently they said yes to John the Baptist. Oh, amen, John. Amen. Oh, yes, preach, John. Preach. But they didn't do anything with his preaching. But the tax collectors and the harlots heard John, and they might have said, wow. No. No, I'm not going to have any part of that. Bringing forth fruits of righteousness, bringing forth fruits of repentance. But as they thought about it, as God dealt with them about it, they believed them. And when they believed them, that's talking about this faith that comes in this spiritual sense. And Jesus said, they repented. And when you saw these other individuals repent, you never relented and believed on him. In other words, you're just like that second son. You're full of amens. You say nothing. Didn't do nothing with it. The other person said, I don't want anything apart, any part of this. He changed his mind. Did something. So what you see here, you see that obedience always accompanies true hearing. 
where just a mental hearing said amen, but it wasn't accompanied with obedience. So you see this word obedience all the time. It accompanies true hearing. Justification is always accompanied with sanctification, which is God's call to obedience in the working out of our salvation. A fake faith or a pretending faith merely listens to the appeals of the New Testament, but doesn't do anything about it. But true faith says, this is my Father calling me to do His will, to answer His call, to walk worthy of the gospel, to live a life separated unto Him, and I'll do so. Jesus, as I said earlier, in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. He said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, that acts like they're heard, have really heard, for they're not found doing the will of the Father. They're found doing all kinds of signs and wonders, but they're not found doing the will of the Father. I could give a flip about somebody's signs and wonders. Makes no difference to me Somebody telling me all the signs, well, I could care less about it. It is a baby Christian that gets all enthused over signs and wonders. Signs and wonders have, in the church where we live in today, have created a superficial church. Now, is there such a thing as signs and wonders in the Bible? Is there such a thing as signs and wonders in the church? Yes. Does this pastor believe in the gifts of the Spirit, the demonstrations of the power of God? Yes. I believe in everything you read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. I believe it's for today. Don't believe it passed away with the apostles. But you don't necessarily have to have the Holy Spirit to have some of these so-called signs and wonders. And if somebody has signs and wonders, but they're not doing the will of the Father, but rather they're found practicing lawlessness, Living for themselves, exalting themselves. How do you know when someone's living for themselves and exalting themselves as a preacher? They're always talking about themselves. They're always talking about their experiences. They're always talking about their anointing. They're talking about their gifting. They're talking about their prophecies. They're talking about this, talking about that, talking about all these other things when they should keep their mouth shut. Remember the donkey that rode into Jesus, sat on his back. When they came into Jerusalem. Was he used by God, that donkey? Sure he was. But at the end of the day, what did he do? Just kept his mouth shut about it. Never said a word about it. I'll tell you how you can really tell if you're led by the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God does not draw any attention to himself. The Spirit of God draws all attention to Christ. And if you're going to say anything about anything, when you get done saying it, people must not know that anything that you're talking about had anything to do with you, but everything to do with Christ. Paul said it this way. He says, I will not talk about the things, anything, except for the things that Christ has done through me. Paul says, we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ Jesus. When you're preaching yourself, you're acting like a false teacher, a false preacher, a Judaizer that is trying to draw attention into yourself. And sadly, you can be a true, blue, gospel-believing Christian and fall into that trap. How do I know that? Because Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6 that whatever, he said, he talks about how the Christian can be worldly-minded in two ways. He can be worldly-minded in his spiritual side of his life he can be worldly minded in the natural side of his life. In the spiritual side of his life, where he gives offerings, where he prays, and where he fasts, he can do spiritual things to be seen of men rather than to be seen of God. Why would, and I know I've done this myself in my foolish years, I would talk about things. Why? Because I wanted you to believe that I'm fired up, I'm on fire for God. But really, it doesn't matter if you believe I'm on fire for God. It really matters if God thinks I'm on fire for Him. And the other way we become worldly-minded in the natural sense is Jesus talks about us being all worried about what we're going to wear, what we're going to 
drank, what we're going to eat, and we're all concerned about life. So there's two ways we can be worldly minded. And we have to realize as Christians, we don't want to be worldly minded in the spiritual sense or in the natural sense. We don't want to align ourselves up with the Pharisees and want everybody to hear about our prayer life. Listen, if you pray, don't ever tell anybody you prayed. The best you could do to encourage somebody, say, I know you're going through a difficult time. We're, we're holding you up in prayer. That's it. Don't tell them how long you prayed. Don't tell them what the Lord said to you. Don't tell them nothing. Keep it down. In other words, if you think that the person you're even talking to might even look at you and kind of get amazed over your spirituality, don't say a word to that person. Don't say a word to that person. Why do I say that? Because you're robbing Christ of his glory. The Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to himself. He gives all the attention to Jesus. He makes sure Jesus gets all the glory, all the credit, all the boasting, right? Well, if he does that, then we should do the same thing. I, I would go to meetings and sometimes drop by mom's house. She says, how was your meeting? I said, oh, we had a good meeting. Lord really blessed us. That's it. We wouldn't go into detail about all the different things that happened. Because I know it's wrong. I didn't always know it was wrong. Because I, I grew up in a, in a group of Christians that that was like commonplace. The Lord told me this and the Lord showed me that. The Lord showed me and the Lord told me. And when the Lord got done dealing with me about all these things, I began to realize that I was looking for recognition. And when the Lord showed me this and, 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 and uh, spanked me over it and, and chastened me over it, I mean, I was sickened in my heart that I even did it. And sometimes to this day, I find myself apologizing to him again and again, though I know I don't need to because I just feel so terrible that I ever did it. You mean, Pastor, you preach yourself? Yeah, one time I did. I preached myself. Why? Because everybody I was listening to was preaching themselves. I didn't know there was anything wrong with it. You can, you can be a real Christian and do dumb things. Have you ever done anything dumb since you've been a Christian? But you're still a Christian. Let's just stop right there. Let's stop right there. Heavenly Father, we love you. We worship you. We bless you. In the name of Jesus, we're grateful and glad that we are Christians and Lord, we're grateful and glad that you are merciful, that on the cross, you put away all of our sins that span before we became a Christian, when we became a Christian, and now after we had become a Christian, you have wiped out the slate clean and we stand before you righteous and holy. Lord, loving you, caring about you, wanting to live the kind of life that only you can enable us to live. May grace abound in our, in our lives, Lord as it expresses itself through righteousness, enabling us to live the kind of life that blesses you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I love each and every one of you.